Hey, Alex, addict and alcoholic. Um, a couple of things just um, for your little segue there, you know, um, I think we all, and I just came back, I'm very, I'm very much in pain. Um, so I'm gonna be painstaking about this phase of my development. I just came back from a uh, six hour hike, um, intermediate. I didn't know what I was getting into, but with two of my um, recovery brothers from Montreal. And I've been pretty emotional the whole drive back. Um, honestly, I think, uh, you know, it was a good reminder that we are all here to um, support one another and learn from one another. It was an amazing day. Um, and just recognizing that I still have um, solids and real ones in my life, you know, and we talked about our sponsorship roles. And it was just such an amazing day as um, we were in very much a lot of agony. And I got so many pictures to go through after this, but you know, I was, um, I was talking to them as we were um, doing the hike and I was saying how I remembered and we'll get into that part of my story in a bit, but I remembered, um, you know, being sent uh, with uh, a government department that I worked with and I got sent on a professional development course and it was out in a park, a national park here in Canada and, you know, I actually went to Toronto before, like the night before the, the bus came um, to pick up um, to make sure I was nice and fucking high for my whole professional leadership course. Um, I almost missed the bus to go on the hike that morning of they had to like drag me out of bed, get down the bus. Anyways, it was the worst hike I've ever been on. But that's a lot of my story, you know. Um, I took everything for granted. I was so unappreciative. I didn't recognize the beauty that surrounds and abounds. Um, like there's nature right in my backyard where I live. Like I live right beside Gatineau Park here in uh, here in the nation's capital. And, you know, um, I just took life for granted, you know. And um, what was all around me for granted really and um we'll get into that in a bit i don't know if there's any newcomers on the um on the on the zoom tonight um if there are i just want you to know that you are the most imperson important person in the zoom room and um you know i'm going to start off with if there's any message that you should get because I will go into, a, and I'm not gonna go into a drug -a log or drunk -a log. Um, I'm beyond that. Um, and I think we're all here for the same reason. We kind of all know how we, we drank and drugged. Um, but, uh, you know, a former sponsor of mine um, always started off her shares with this. And I think it's very important just to get it right out there um, in case I don't mention it throughout. But, you know, um, five key messages, you know, one, don't pick up and use no matter what. Two, um, go to meetings. Three, get a home group and get a sponsor. Four, work your steps. And five, um, be of service. And those are definitely elements um, that I've uh, incorporated into my, my life today. Um, here I am, I'm hitting 1500 days uh, clean and sober tomorrow, 1500 days ago, I would have never even thought that possible, plausible or even fathomable. And my life today is, um, is not even one I ever dreamt of. Um, it's, it far exceeds any expectation I had. Um, but we'll get into we'll get into that revolutionary change in my spiritual awakening and uh, my rebirth date of April twenty second, twenty seventeen. Um, also, if you're a newcomer, um, just the fact that you're on the Zoom tonight. Um, if you can't believe in yourself, know that I believe in you. There's a whole room of people here that believe in you, and you know what I'm about to tell you. Anything is absolutely possible. Recovery is possible. However, like Tom was mentioning in the promises, and that is my favorite, um, you know, the step nine promises are absolutely my favorite, um, my favorite reading. They do come true. They absolutely do. I notice a direct correlation. However, you know, like we say at the end, um, you know, the promises do materialize. Granted, we work for them, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, 
um, but they will materialize if you put in the work. And um, I'll get into that uh, a little later on. I'm not gonna go too much into my backstory. Um, you know, there are some marking events, uh, very marking events in my life. The further I get into my recovery now at uh, four years and one month in, obviously for me, recovery is absolutely a transformative process in and of itself. And, um, you know, it's, it's uncovering, discovering and recovering myself on the daily. And <clears throat> um, my father was an addict and an alcoholic. And, you know, I, uh, so it's definitely in my DNA, um, but he was an absent father. Uh, so I have daddy abandonment issues, you know, when I came in in year one and, you know, my, my ultimate goal was just to, you know, stop drinking and drugging. Um, those were things that I hadn't yet discovered about myself or explored or even unraveled yet, you know, um, so the deeper I go in, in introspection and in retrospect, you know, I'm starting to explore some, some traumatic events in my life um, and, and deeper underlying issues because the problem was never the drugs and alcohol. Those were just the solutions to my problems. And, and you know, I definitely, definitely displayed the, um, the behavioral patterns and the character defects and the character traits of an addict and an alcoholic long before I knew I was an addict and an alcoholic. Um, so going back to my father, um, he was also black, so I'm of mixed origin. Um, so not only do I have my daddy abandonment issues from, from a very young age, um, and that also led to, you know, my, my addictions are not only limited to um, alcohol and drugs, um, you know, I have codependency, I have sex addiction, love addiction, emotional addiction, and, it, you know, going back to it now, it's because I was always seeking that male figure in my life that was not present back then. Uh, my mom was a single mother, um, worked, you know, seven jobs, uh, seven days a week, three jobs, seven days a week to provide for us, and I took absolute advantage of that from a very young age. I was a master manipulator. I um, stole from her from a very young age because I absolutely always had to have the nicest gear. You know, um, we say we have that disease of illusion and I always put the hyphen mark in disease. I do have a disease, I have an illness, but you know, it's a dis-ease with self. I'm uneasy with myself. Um, but you know, I always had to have the dopest gear, the nicest kicks, the everything, right? So that disease of illusion, never enough. So whatever it was, there was just never enough of it, you know? And by the end, you know, that, that whole saying that we have, one too many, a thousand never enough, try like 5,000 never enough for me. And I almost did just drop the F-bomb there, except, um, you know, how we learn and we grow from each other. I have the utmost respect for Tom. Um, so whenever he's in the room, I actually make a conscious effort. And I think the last couple of times I shared and he was in the room, I didn't even drop one F-bomb. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, I had an identity crisis from a very young age being of mixed origin. I was never white enough for the white, never black enough for the black. You know, what seems like a very menial event or very menial, like trivial that you could laugh about it today, obviously really marked me if at the age of 42, I'm still thinking about it today. But I was um, teased in the schoolyard at the age of seven and I wasn't any color by that point. I was just blue in the face trying to defend myself because I was being called, um, you know, chocolate by, by a white girl. And I was never that blonde haired, blue eyed girl. Um, you know, I definitely, my, have complexes about my, my appearance um, at that young age already. You know, I was bigger boned. I was always taller than all the other girls. Um, I have a bubble butt. Uh, my hair's curly. I have tried to straighten it uh, many a time. Actually, it really changed texture over the years from the amounts of time I cut it, which is very, very weird. But, um, and, you know, so, so just all that. So I was always from a very young age seeking validation, um, seeking to be a part of, seeking to be accepted because even right down in my own family, 
even though my grandfather absolutely loved his, his granddaughters, I have an older sister, even though my grandfather absolutely loved his granddaughters, like my, my maternal grandfather, he was an absolute racist. Like he didn't even go to my mom and dad's wedding. Um, he only started talking to my dad when they had my sister because she was his first grandchild. And, you know, but he didn't even go to my dad and mom's wedding because my mom was marrying a black man. And um, so as much as he loved his granddaughters, you know, the, the racial slurs. So I, I, I never felt really comfortable in, in his house. Um, and then, you know, uh, the further I got along, once I started trying to hang out with black people, you know, or dating black guys that I went through a period where I was just hanging out with black people, but like, you know, I wasn't accepted by the black girls. Like she's so light skinned. She's not dark enough. She's not, you know, so I never really fit in anywhere um, in any group today. I definitely recognize I'm the best of both worlds. So, um, you know, but um, that led me to, you know, I had an older sister. Um, I always wanted to be that that schoolyard incident. After that, I, I became a bully and I really wanted to, um, you know, I thought I was always the toughest. I always wanted to be gangster. And I hung out with gangsters, you know, from a very young age. And um, at the age of 10, I started drinking and, um, and using, mind you, back then, you know, I, I'll definitely say it, and I can't even believe it's legalized nationally in Canada, but like marijuana was definitely my gateway drug. Um, I will say it, like there's no debate about it, no ifs, ends, buts about it. It was definitely my gateway drug. And, um, but you know, what started out at such a young age as recreational use, I can't tell you where along that line it became daily habitual abuse, but it crossed that line fairly quickly over the years. I just always thought I was so functional. Um, you know, I was always academically successful. I, um, I was professionally successful. Like I fast-tracked high school. I got my university degree at the age of 20 and I got into the federal government uh, here in Canada at a very young age and it was an entry level. Um, you know, I was already a regional manager at the age of 22. All my employees were older than me. So I was all financially well off. I was professionally well off. I was regarded as a whiz kid, you know, and, um, but I led this dual life, you know, an absolute dual life. And maybe to just go back a little bit, because I will talk about, um, you know, how, how drugging and drinking were obviously, um, over time, um, it consumed, they, you know, cocaine and alcohol consumed my every thought, so I consumed them. And by the end of it, when you say, you know, um, living to use and using to live, like it had become my, it had become my identity. It, it was my lifestyle. It's all I knew from a very young age. And when we say when we come into recovery and we say we find ourselves, I go back to it and say, how could I find something I never lost? Because having started to use and booze at that young age, I, I didn't know who I was whatsoever, ever, um, outside of that, right? And, and I glorified it and I prided myself on it, you know? I could out snort you, out party you, out drink you, um, out F you. Um, and, and, you know, you could stay up for four days, I could stay up for five, like, you know, it was, it was a competition, really. Um, and I always prided myself on that. And I lived a dual life. But um, going back to, you know, it's stripping me of, it's crazy, you know, looking back on it now, how we create our own insanity, ruin, misery, and demise. Like, honestly, that's what I did over the span of 28 years. Um, I wanted to follow in my mother's footsteps. So my parents are both um, very artistic. My dad um, is a trained Shakespearean actor. My mom was a model and um, a professional ballerina. She danced for the National Ballet of Canada and Les Grands Ballets. Um, so she was a professional ballerina. So in terms of my upbringing, a very, very liberal upbringing, you know, discipline structure. And then plus, you know, by, certain times she was she was hardly ever home because one of her jobs of her three jobs seven days a week was a flight attendant 
And, um, you know, she, she was rarely home. So I took advan full advantage of that, right? Like the parties in the house from a very young age, hanging out with the gangsters who were stealing her stuff, punching holes in our walls, like the violence started very young. Um, and this was my entourage and that was always my entourage and what I was attracted to because you know how we say addiction doesn't discriminate? Well, neither do the people drugging and drinking with you. Like that's all we have in common. And that's all I ever had in common, even in terms of all my relationships over the years, which are very few. But, you know, um, going back to it, par for course, you know, the compromising situations I put myself in, as much as I was drugging and drinking every night, I was sleeping with another guy every night, right? I, I glorified that. Um, and then the very few relationships that I did have were all codependent. The only things we had in common were drugs and alcohol and facilitating and enabling it. Um, and, uh, and, but I always, you know, as soon as you showed me that little extra bit of attention, like even my um, daughter's dad was only supposed to be a one night stand at the age of 28. And because he showed me that extra bit of attention the next day when he came back to my house, I didn't even remember his name. Um, it was love at first sight. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'll get into that in a minute because um, that is another marking event. But at 13, I came uh, to Ottawa actually where I live now um, because I wanted to follow in my mother's footsteps. And I had gotten on a scholarship to the only French arts high school in all of Ontario. And um, I was in contemporary dance, except my mother wasn't going to get her 13 year old daughter an apartment uh, to herself at that age, which is probably a very wise decision. And um, I lived with nuns and remember a very liberal upbringing. Like I didn't have a curfew. I didn't have anything by that, like at the age of 13 and structure and discipline. Um, Let's just say me and the nuns didn't work out, but up until that point, you know, I was raised Catholic. My mother's still very practicing Catholic today. I, I practice, like I was a practicing Catholic. Um, and uh, I got so disillusioned with, with religion. So any faith I had up until that point, um, leaving that nun house that year, uh, my dance career was short-lived by the way, like I only lasted a year and I went back to Toronto right away. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just starting to form my own, um, feminist ideologies. I was 13. I still had a head on my shoulders and, um, but I tell you my rebelliousness started more than, um, and that's when I started getting into heavier stuff and more frequently. And um, obviously being an artist, I thought I was a great dancer on acid. So, and I had three hours of dance class every day. So I was like dropping hits of acid to go to dance class. Um, so yeah, so, you know, but I got completely um, disillusioned with Catholicism. I thought it was a crock of shit. And um, I left there, no more faith. So my, any faith I had up until that point completely, vanished. I didn't believe in a God. I didn't believe in anything anymore. And um, moved back to Toronto, but then I went to university. So like I said, right, I always academically successful as much as I wanted to be a high school dropout in grade 10, because I was in the brave scene, you know, and if you could pay me to be a professional party person, that's definitely the career choice I would have taken. However, um, like I say, and I was even dealing at that time and stuff and not a good career choice for Alex because she was doing all her own stash and like I owed money everywhere already, right? Um, so I ended up fast tracking high school and going to university where I thought, you know, there's not gonna be as much cliques. I'm gonna be accepted. People are more philosophical. Everybody hangs out together, um, except like the university I went to at the time had like six bars on campus. And uh, I still managed to get a university degree, uh, but I'd sit there like, Okay, it's almost 1 a.m. Last calls at 2 a.m. I better get my, okay, I'm going to submit my paper now. And I'd rush to the bar, you know, and like, I always lived this dual life over the years um, until that dual life. And I don't know when it became one, but it did. And, you know, when we say paying the high costs for our poor decisions, I did because it stripped me of um, any judgment I had went right out the window, you know, um, 
And again, just taking, taking life for granted and taking everything for granted and everything was owed to me. Um, I don't say I was an ego. I don't say I was egotistical. I was an egomaniac. Even looking back on it today, I could definitely say that I was a narcissist. Um, and, you know, I was just power hungry and money hungry. And my career was the, the number one thing and, you know, moving up the ranks and that's all I wanted to do, but I was still leading this double life. And, you know, I was starting to get older, you know, what I could do at the age of 20, show up to work from 6 a.m. and like be at work by seven, just didn't work anymore. But that's the, that's the, the pace that I was still trying to keep later on in life. Um, in that, you know, like the blackouts started. Um, I've put myself in so many compromising situations. I can definitely sit here today and tell you that I definitely had a higher power with me that entire time. Because I don't even know, like, you know, waking up on the other side of the city, um, not knowing if I was gang banged, who I was with, where my wallet was, where my clothes were, how do you call a taxi to ask them to come pick you up when you don't even know where the hell you are. Um, and just never knowing, like putting my safety and my security and my womanhood in complete jeopardy all the time, constantly. It was par for course, it was so normal to me. Everything became so normalized and, and just a daily thing. Um, what I didn't realize over that time is that I was slowly and silently killing and ruining myself on every level. So mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, and then 28 years later, financially and professionally. At the age of 28, um, I, like I was saying earlier, um, this is another marking event in my life. Um, I met a guy at a bar and uh, like I said, he came back to my house the next day. I didn't even remember his name. I remember just giving him a piece of paper and saying, oh, can you write down your name? Or no, I didn't. I said, oh, put your phone number because I knew that if I took the phone number down, he wouldn't put his name on top, right? Because I was writing it down. So I gave him, his, I'm like, leave me your phone number and I'll call you, you know? Um, we clearly didn't know each other, um, but like I said, right, and that love addiction and that emotional addiction and meeting that male figure in my life, and I'll tell you what, all the males that I have been with are very much like my father. Um, you know, addicts, alcoholics, um, as much as they were emotionally damaged, I can definitely tell you today at four years and one month into my recovery, I was effing emotionally damaged myself. Um, so, so he ended up showing me just that little bit of extra attention and, um, it was love at first sight. I didn't know what I was getting into and we had actually broken up two months later. Um, however, I found out I was pregnant and I wasn't even going to tell him, but I live in Gatineau, um, up in Canada, a very small, um, small city like he would know like walking down the street with a child in nine months I thought I was mentally ready I was financially ready I had a great role model um, in my mother as a single mother I thought I was ready and another thing um, that led me to absolutely wanting to have that baby is because she was definitely a miracle she's a miracle in more ways than one but I couldn't understand why, like I had an abortion at the age of 16. I couldn't understand why between the age of 16 and 28. And I'll tell you what, like the guys that I've slept with are like, and none of that was protected sex, by the way. So how did I not get pregnant between 16 and 28 again? Um, I probably made the... Um, worst decision I could have made for myself um, and my well-being but I offered him you know I said you could be in 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 the child's life as much as you want or as little as you want you know and he said right away I'm moving in 
we only knew each other two months. So we did not know each other at all. And he came with a whole baggage of issues um, himself. Um, and, you know, right down to gambling addiction, and I'm not going to get into his story, but um, that had a huge impact on me. That was my first foray into sobriety. However, it was forced sobriety. But for those nine months that I was pregnant, I didn't touch a thing at all. Um, not even a drag of a cigarette in that time. The minute I found out I was pregnant, like that was it. And, you know, I had her. And just the, those nine months um, were hell with him. There was no love there. And, you know, that went on for another two years afterwards. So three years too long and went through a tumultuous um, breakup and custody battle. And, um, you know, right down to stalking, right down to, and, but again, the success that I always had, right. And I always looked so good on paper and it was me providing financially for everyone all the time, because I would do anything to stay in that relationship, honestly. Um, I needed that man. I needed that male figure in my life, right? There was my codependency. I need a relationship, you know, not want, I need it. Um, and, you know, that even the judge, even the judge at our custody battle, like I got exclusive custody, but he told us straight up that we were horrible. Like, what are you guys doing? like be parents, you know, and you'd think that would have woken me up, but it really didn't. And I got into shady relationships afterwards. Um, you know, what was supposed to be my daughter's safe haven became a place where she couldn't even be comfortable anymore. Um, you know, what I put her through and during a podcast interview a couple of years ago, um, she actually heard me tell that part of this, my story for the first time. And she said, so I was an accident. Uh, I was a, I was a mistake. And I said, you were never a mistake. You just weren't planned. And you were the best thing that happened to me in my life. It just took me 10 years too long to show you. Um, she definitely is a miracle, you know, and she definitely is my why. So fast forward, you know, um, I was a deplorable parent for her first 10 years of life. Um, I was in active addiction and like the full throws. Now at this point, like I'm in full, full, full on throws um, going, you know, and again, always looking good on paper, however, and always having that level of success, right? So even when I, I won exclusive custody of her, Alex just won, you know, like, ha, 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 I showed them, you know, as much as he tried to drag my name in the mud and say I was an addict and an alcoholic, which I clearly was, but I was just in denial. Um, and I was in denial for a very long time because of that dis-ease of perception now, right? Um, everybody was below me. Everything was beneath me. I wasn't a criminal like the rest of you. I wasn't a criminal like the rest of them. Um, you know, I was the shit. Uh, I work for a high ranking public service employee, you know, I, I work for deputy heads, I'm working in ministers offices. Um, so for you guys in the States, that's like equivalent to a commissioner of a federal government department or a senator or governor. Um, and I just think I am invincible. Honestly, I really thought I was invincible. And, um, you know, as much as I looked good on paper and on the outside, um, I was starting to look actually horrible on the outside. And I thought it looked, I looked completely normal, like, but I had gashes under my, I don't know if you guys saw my before pictures on Instagram, but like gashes under my, I looked like hell, honestly. And I thought that was totally normal. And I'd go talk to Hallie as school teachers that way. I'd be driving her, you know, I always had her in competitive soccer, competitive synchronized swimming, all those materialistic things, the appearances, the image on the outside. Meanwhile, you know, I'm driving her and putting her own life in danger, um, bringing her everywhere, totally under the influence, high and drunk all the time. Um, you know, so not only my life, but my daughter's life here in danger all the time, constantly not even knowing who I'm letting in my house, the revolving door. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of stuff that happened uh, that happened in our house that she shouldn't have had to endure or witness whatsoever. 
And she had to grow up, you know, very quickly um, for her age. She, she, there was a lot of her taking care of me for a long time and uh, babysitting everybody else's kids while we're all here in the living room, getting high and drunk together, you know, and uh, poor her not even being able to sleep and having to get to school for like 7.30 a.m., you know, it, it, it it's, um, I was definitely not the mother that I thought I was. I thought I, I thought I was a glowing mother back then, but I don't get any rewards for being a glowing mother back then. Um, my last year, you know, in lead up to my spiritual awakening on April 22nd, 2017, um, there were a lot of um, rock bottoms and a lot of wake up calls. One, I couldn't um, bring myself um, that summer of 2016, I couldn't even bring myself to walking in, to, to getting out of my car one morning and going into the office. Um, I was tweaking. And um, so instead what I did, I called in and said I had gotten in the car accident, which I clearly didn't. And um, I went on a two month rampage. Like I didn't go into work for two months. I started forging um, doctor's notes. Um, Throughout this time, I was already starting to use, you know, um, public funds to fund my habits. So as much as, again, let's go back to that disease of perception and Alex is invincible and Alex ain't like the rest of you. Um, I was committing white collar crime, you know, and I thought I was getting away with it. I was, because um, I'd been doing it over the span of a lot of years. But, you know, using my government travel card to travel to the liquor store, um, take out cash advances to foot the bill for my, 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 my eight balls, like you name it, right? Um, complete lack of judgment. And like I say, now, now my dual life, I don't have a dual life anymore. Like it's all one. Um, and I'm making serious, serious mistakes on the job. I'm supposed to be a manager. Um, supposed to be held by a code of ethics. I had no more morals, values, you name it. I was stripped of any dignity. I was stripped of any judgment. I was, I, I was in a state of desperation by the end. Um, that November as well, you know, where, you know, people think, you know, again, that, that perception, right? And those preconceived notions, um, you know, that, that drunks are, are homeless and, you know, brown paper bag on the street. And I was near homelessness because one morning at, at nine o'clock in the morning when my door knocked, it was a bailiff um, presenting me with a notice of foreclosure on my condo because I hadn't been paying my mortgage in seven months. Apparently the bank wants their money back after seven months, just heads up. Um, and right there and then that, that definitely um, gave me a wake up call that I needed. That's when I started realizing like, what are you doing with your life? And I'm financially well off. I have nothing to show for it and I still don't have anything to show for it today. Um, obviously like, you know, making my financial amends everywhere. Um, but uh, I almost had me and my daughter living in the street and I work for a deputy head. <laughs> like this is just all, absurd so when I go back to creating that insanity for ourselves that demise misery and ruin like I created it the choices I was making like the horrible horrible decision making um, and those horrible decision makings were happening at work and happening in all areas of my life you know um, but that minute you know I I told myself Sorry, I'm just gonna check. Okay. That minute I told myself, I was like, Alex, what are you doing? And I had stopped. And um, lucky enough, you know, when we say that little mustard seed of faith, that, that little mustard seed needs to be planted, that's it. That mustard seed was planted. I had stayed connected with a, with a girl, a, a much younger girl than me that, um, that, had, that we had met in active addiction and we, honestly party together almost every night um she was much younger she was dating one of my friends and I I always said we were putting each other's lives for a reason like this one we were we're high but you know I I got her to break up with him as much as he was my drug and like he was my little brother you know um you know we drug and drink together every night me and him 
but I was like, he's using you, like, assume yourself as a woman, you know, and I, I, I got, like, she broke up with him, but we stayed connected, but she went off her rocker and committed herself and went to rehab, and at that time, she was about three months into, uh, into her program, and I called her. The intent was there, but the, the will and that turning it over piece, like, I didn't know any of that yet, and that, that wasn't there, and it just wasn't my time, and again, you know, going back to perfect timing and, you know, the time now is all in God's hands. And I recognize that today it was not my time yet. Um, however, you know, when it became my time, you know, I real I realized that I've been given a chance. I've been given a gift to recover. And that's how I, uh, that's how I treat my recovery. You know, it is a gift. But I went with her to a to her fellowships masquerade ball that December um, 31st, and it's really funny. You know, I always say such an analogy because um, I wasn't wearing a mask, but I was the only one wearing a mask there because I got high that whole day. Went and picked her up. Thought, you know, if I didn't get high for two hours, I'd be considered clean. I was at that masquerade ball. Um, the countdown couldn't come quick enough. And apparently I had another four month hurrah left in me, like my final, my final hurrah. But I was getting into another codependent relationship. Um, things were just starting to pile. And by the end of it, you know, the week before, um, April 22nd, 2017, I, uh, in, a, in an act of complete desperation because my dealers weren't even coming to my house anymore. When your dealers have cause for concern, there's a real big problem. These are not my friends. Um, but you know, I was being told to get off the street. Um, they weren't coming to my house anymore. So I drove across town. I picked up off of somebody. I had no idea who he was. Um, and I could tell you for putting um, cocaine up my nose for that amount of time over the, that many years every day, whatever I put up my nose was definitely not cocaine. And in a drug induced psychosis, the only way I thought I could get down from that high was to take my own life. Again, my higher power has always been with me. I just never tapped into it because I'm here to live, to tell the tale today. Finally, that last week was just, um, just horrendous. I, I didn't know it was, it was the end, but it was. Um, and then April 22nd, 2017, I will go to my grave um, convinced and sold on the fact, and I know I say this in all my shares, but like convinced and sold. Um, I had done my step one, two, and three before I ever walked in the room. And unconsciously though, because I didn't even know what the steps were at the time, obviously. But there was a power greater than myself in my room that morning as I lay there trying to sleep. Um, as I lay there trying to sleep, I got woke. And my thought process is so vivid. And I could tell you revolutionary change happened the minute I went into faith-based thinking and surrendered. And I didn't get down on my knees, but I did surrender. And there's just something that clicked in my head and I flipped the script right there. And that power greater than myself that was in the room with me that day helped me finally make admonition to self um, that I was no better than anybody else and that I was just a junkie and an alcoholic. And Alex, you have a serious problem and you need help and you need it now. So I called my girlfriend back from four months prior and um, she brought me to the rooms and there's been no turning back since. However, in my head that day, um, I don't call it my rebirth, I don't call it my dry date, I don't call it my clean date, it's absolutely my rebirth date. Real transformation requires real honesty. And again, let's come back to the way I approach my recovery. Recovery is absolutely a transformative process. It's ongoing, daily, lifelong. I'm gonna be working on myself on every level. I have a three-pronged disease, um, a mental obsession, a physical compulsion, and a spiritual malady. And I can't get away from not attacking those three elements on the daily. Um, our mind, body, and soul, 
are synergistic and recovery is absolutely coming to a balanced, aligned and harmonious state. Um, so that's definitely the way I approach it. But, you know, in my head that day, that life that I was living, which was not a life to be living at all, um, no longer served any purpose. And that woman I was completely ceased to exist. Like I don't even look the same. And what I was doing to myself wasn't fair to me, but it was not fair to my daughter. And she was gonna actually be 10 years old um, in a couple months time. Now she's gonna be 14 in August. But she was going to be 10 that that summer. And, you know, what kind of a woman am I raising if I'm not walking the walk and talking the talk? Like I started living that kind of life at her age. So it's time for me to step up to the plate and be a parent and a real parent and be the mother that she so deserves. I'm a single mother. It's always just been the two of us, you know, as much as our bond has always been strong today. It's stronger than ever. Um, unfortunately, she is going through her, her own mental health issues and her own forms of addiction right now, but I'm able to be a fully present, um, present mother and be there to support her and be able to show her that there's always light within the darkness and actually employ the tools that I've learned here with her, right? Um, it's, it's kind of, um, it's amazing actually. Um, I'm happy I can be there for her because four years ago, if this, she was going through what she's going through now, I, I definitely would not be able to be there for her whatsoever um, and to support her and to try to find solutions, right? Living in the solution. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I went downtown on myself and you know how we say, everything catches up to you. Um, I was one month into my recovery. Luckily enough, I had been going to meetings every day. So that already that part of my, you know, when I started doing meditation and prayer in the morning and stuff. Um, one month into recovery, I got called into my boss's office. And um, I honestly thought I was going in there to talk about future staffing actions. I had my org chart out because I was already starting to excel again at work and, and my performance was starting to get better at work and out of left field you know and I had even made the joke when I when I when I went in there and I said it's not every day Alex gets summons to the big boss's office and he's like sit down and within 15 minutes I was being escorted out of the building and Tom can attest to this once you're in the federal government of Canada you're in the federal government of Canada like Alex is the only person that gets fired. Oh, in their words, terminated without cause. Um, <laughs> but I was terminated. I got given the pink slip. And, you know, I almost did take my severance package and run with it. Like, don't think that thought didn't cross my mind. But then I told myself, this is an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity for you to work on yourself from the inside out because at that point I was 225 pounds. Um, I always go back to that 225 pound woman because she was a direct, her outer was a direct reflection of her inner self. That 28 years, it was a culmination of 28 years of substance abuse, a complete, complete lack of self-respect for myself. Therefore I didn't command or demand respect in return nor did I give it a disregard for my health and wellness, my safety and security and that of my daughters. And then again, stripped of any dignity I had. And you know, um, that by the end, caring for myself, I, I let myself go so bad. Um, I couldn't even take care of myself in terms of basic hygiene. Like I wasn't showering anymore. I was shitting and pissing. My, I smelled like shit. I look like shit. Um, but, you know, going back to it and thinking about it, you know, when I decided to rid myself of all toxicity, and I mean, I rid myself of all toxicity, that shit was cut at the umbilical cord. All my friends today, unless you're in my family, you're in recovery. Any pathway, though, like it doesn't matter if it's AA, but like all my friends are in some form of recovery um, and they're sober.
you know, I, I don't hang out with anybody outside of the community. Um, but yeah, so, you know, when I decided to rid myself of all toxicity, that was people, places, and things, thoughts, substances, activities, right down to the food I consumed. So when I adopted clean living, I adopted clean eating, I adopted clean living 100. Um, you know, recovery is absolutely a lifestyle. And again, going back to it, it's a transformative process in and of itself. You know, the goal is not to be cleaner. And you guys have heard me say this before. The goal is not to be clean and or sober. The goal is to love yourself enough to live an addiction or alcohol free life. And it's not about abstinence. Um, you know, it's about creating a quality of life for yourself and coming back to a state of health and wellness. And that's a holistic approach, but holistic to me, right? My whole well being, my whole welfare. So um, I definitely, you know, half measures avail me absolutely nothing. I'm always told that I'm quite intense. Um, and, you know, that's just because that energy that I used to have, I used to be intense and active addiction, trust me, I would go to any lengths and means to get what I needed, that I'm definitely going to be intense and um, chase my recovery like I used to chase my next high and drunk. Because if my recovery is not my top priority, everything that I've built for myself in these last four years, and everything I love is going to come last. So today, like stuff that I would have never even thought happened, let's go back to those promises at the beginning. And had you told me my life was going to be this good, I would have done this years ago, except it just wasn't my time, you know, and even with my relationship with God back then, you know, it would, um, and my, my concept of God has evolved over the last four years. Like what I did today, going hiking like that in the majestic, um, beauty and you know elemental energy that used to be my higher power at the beginning four years ago because I started noticing connecting my breath connecting don't think I woke up on day two and I was a competitive bodybuilder I was 225 pounds I was so unhealthy malnourished I, I was I was out of shape completely you know so me I would go I started doing yoga and connecting my mind body soul breath connecting to nature, connecting to community, you know, um, and, and connecting, connecting to self and higher power. And at that time, it was definitely uh, sourcing the elemental energy around me. My concept has evolved over time. And today I do pray to God every morning. But it's funny, because I'm even recognizing my relationship with God back in active addiction I I would sometimes pray but it was always to get something it was like oh I need money to go pick up can you like make money appear you know today I um live my life and going back to that faith-based thinking right and that blind faith everything start begins and ends in the mind by the way and even behavioral you know it's a behavioral habit change our behavioral patterns those are all up here um, but that faith-based thinking for me is the most revolutionary change because I just live out thy will be done, you know, today. I just ask God what his will and way for me is to sh divinely show me in carrying out whatever message it is he intends of me and whatever work it is of his that he intends of me in through and around me on a daily basis outcomes, logistics, timelines. That's not up to me, man. I have the wisdom today to know the difference between what's within my control and what isn't. Um, and like I go back to those promises, right? If we are painstaking about this stage of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. I'm only at four years and one month in. I'm just at the beginning. This ain't no halfway through. God willing, I'm in this for the long haul. And I got to tell you, I'm already pretty effing amazed because let me tell you, I'm back in the federal public service today. When we talk about angels being put on our paths, somebody was following my story on social media and um, 
called, sent me a Facebook messenger out of nowhere on a Monday morning. And within three weeks, I was his senior policy advisor getting back into the federal government. He got me my indeterminacy, indeterminacy again. Um, I didn't start at day one. I continued on at my years of service. Today, I'm a strategic advisor to two executives um, at 21 years of service. Like, everything just happened god's work god's taught like i just can't even all this stuff is inexplicable that happens to me i'm a competitive bodybuilder who would have thought like i certainly didn't like that was never even a thought in in my thoughts back then you know four years ago i just represented canada like team canada in vegas in november um my relationship with my daughter i'm able to be a fully present, clear-minded mother and, and there for her always, you know, um, my relationship with my mother, you know, as much as she always questions what she could have had done differently. I think a lot of you guys have actually met her. Um, she is my angel, you know, her unconditional love. She never gave up on me as many times as I failed her. She was always there for me. Um, she often asks herself what she could have done differently. And I tell her, there's nothing you could have done differently, but look at me today. I'm finally the daughter you raised, the mother you raised, the woman you raised, like you raised me right. Again, I had to apparently go through that, right? Um, but like I say, right, our chances, we only get so many chances before they run out. I will never be able to explain why I've been given the chance to recover because I could tell you there's a lot of times that I came close to not getting this chance. And for me, you know, what has so freely, um, generously and graciously been offered to me, I absolutely have to be willing to give it away to keep it. Today, I run a national nonprofit organization, Sober Active Canada. That's like my ultimate service work, but I'm also a very active member in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, unfortunately, we're still on Zooms here. We're not back in person, but you know, I'm always a service, whether it be hosting, um, you know, and chairing um, my home groups meetings, um, the regional conferences, making sandwiches. I have sponsees. And, you know, I always say, and I'm going to wrap it up because I know uh, it's all, oh, wow, Daphne was right, because I'm one minute past the time. But um, I always say, you know, um, I'm going to finish with three key points. I've been a public service employee for 21 years, except I'm finally of service to the public um in, in the work I do and what I'm passionate about today and I'm actually looking to um within the next year leave the public service and make my you know my ultimate goal is to open Canada's first recovery based gym um and run my nonprofit. and right now I'm juggling everything um and juggling everything cannot come at you know me neglecting my own recovery and um, come at the detriment of my daughter, which I find myself addicted to being busy and doing, doing, doing. Um, so Daphne's really helping me with that a lot. And like I say, when I go back to, you know, it's work on the daily, I'm a work in progress. I'll forever be working on myself. You know, there's a point at this four year juncture in my journey that something had to give. So I've gone back to basics. I'm I got DAF as my sponsor. I'm reworking my steps formally. Change is inevitable. I'm not the same person I was five minutes ago. So, but transformation is a conscious choice, right? So it's that further evolution of mind, body, and soul for me. Um, and you know, we're the greatest projects we'll ever work on. Um, and that's the most fulfilling. Yes, it's hard work. It's a labor of love, but it's the most fulfilling gratifying and worthwhile work you can do for yourself um and I'll finish it the way I finished my podcast with uh with Johnny you know earlier this week um because I think it's a really good message but um 
self-care is self-love, self-love is self-respect, and self-respect is self-discipline. Respect yourself, respect your efforts, and once you have all four of those under your belt, there lies true power. Thank you so much. Thank you for keeping me another day clean and sober. I love you guys. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to have shared and I will take another 24 and pass it back over to Daph so she can close up. Oh my gosh, I did run on. <laughs>